let us give thanks to God the Father, always and for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. God our Father, we give you thanks for all your gifts so freely bestowed upon us, for the beauty and wonder of your creation in earth and sky and sea, for all that is gracious in the lives of men and women, revealing the light of Christ, for minds to amuse and hearts to love and hands to serve, for health and strength to work, for leisure to rest and play, for communion with your saints in all times and places, and above all, for the great promises and mercies given to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. To him be praise and glory with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever.
the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord our God, that we may honor you with all our mind and love everyone in truth of heart. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now Amen. and forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. And may Almighty God bless you and remain with you always, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Regina, Mother is very This evening we will be meditating upon a portion of the Acts of the Apostles, the section actually that gives the title for the um, document which our Holy Father used to initiate the year of faith. The passage this evening ends off with the Apostles opening up the door of faith to the people of the area, both Jews and Gentiles, the two groups that are mentioned in the reading this evening. Uh, this is the, the early church. The apostles would go to the synagogues, they were Jewish, uh, and proclaim Christ. They would go on the streets. There would be Jews and Gentiles together. And they would boldly proclaim the word of God. This is a term that is found uh, just before the passage which we will be praying this evening, how the apostles went to Iconium and uh, boldly proclaimed the faith in the resurrection of our Lord. And I think that's a spirit which needs to animate all of us in our daily lives as Christians to proclaim the faith boldly in a world which uh, is, not, uh, is often not very much uh, inclined to accept the voice, the message of faith. We try to open the door of faith, but there are people who are kind of pushing back and really don't particularly want to have the door of faith opened. But also, it's a thing, I think the faith comes by hearing. We hear uh, in other portions of scripture in St. Paul, and um, that's important. We each of us receive the invitation to see with the eyes of faith, to be given the supernatural gift of faith, but we need to have it offered to us. Uh, I was just uh, today at the seminary at a come and see weekend where we invite people to come to consider a vocation to the priesthood. And we reflect upon the fact that our Lord himself when um, would say, come and see, when people would inquire, he'd say, come and see. 
So it's an invitation to, to see, to hear, to encounter, above all, to encounter the master, the Lord who speaks, who's calling for us. And each one of us in our different ways, we can think as we reflect upon and pray the reading this evening, we'll hear of, uh, of Paul and we'll have, hear of the apostles, but we should think of ourselves as they're going from place to place in cities we've never heard of, you know, they're, they're distant places, but they stand for our own place. You can just add in, change the names from the map and think they're going from place to place, proclaiming boldly the name of Jesus, the faith, but also their own experience of an encounter with the risen Lord so that others might be welcome to share in that gift of faith. This is something central to our, our life as Christians. Uh, this day, we also begin our pastoral plan for our archdiocese. And we do so as people who care for those who are gathered together, the pastoral care for the gathered in the imitation of St. Peter, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. But also as in today's reading of Alexio, apostolic, reaching out to the scattered, to the people who have either not heard the faith or who have lost the faith and who need to have it reproposed to them in a way in which it is not distorted by our own frailties and all the different barriers we put up that in sense block the door of faith. At the end, we hear how Paul opens the door of faith to the Gentiles but we can block it. We can put stuff under the door of faith to stop it from opening. And that is either our own sinfulness, our bad example, or it can be all kinds of things, our ineptness at proclaiming the word of God, all kinds of things we have to think about. How can I unblock the door of faith or to put it in a way that Origen put it, how can I open up a pathway to our hearts so that the Lord may enter in? And so this evening we'll be meditating upon this very central passage of the year of faith. Uh, so different from where we are, so many strange names, so many different types of experiences. I don't think we're likely to find if we successfully preach the word of God to have people offering bulls and things like that in our honor. This is it's a different cultural thing. And yet the message is there and the reality is the same. We are called to propose and to repropose the call of faith, the invitation to the people of our day as the apostles did, as we hear in the Acts of the Apostles. So now we, we enter into Lectio Divina in a spirit of prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us, let all those worries and cares and so many things that block up our own ears and hearts, occupy them, so there is no room for the Lord to enter in. Let us say, let, let us just get rid of those and say, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Take away from me these cares and let me be, at least for this time in my day, attentive to your voice to the offer, to the invitation of faith. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Let us ask God's mercy for the sins that so occupy our hearts all those things which block the pathway to our hearts and leave no room for the Lord, his word or his presence. Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Lord, help me to, to see and to hear what these holy words say. To my head that I may know you, to my heart that I may love you, to my hands that 
that I may serve you. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was a cripple from birth who had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and walked. And when the crowd saw that what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Laconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul because he was the chief speaker they called Hermes and the priest of Zeus whose temple was in front of the city brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the people but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it they tore their garments and rushed out among the multitude crying men who why are you doing this we also are men of like nature with you and bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good and gave you from heaven rains and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. With these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came out there from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the people, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. And when they arrived, they gathered the church together and declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles and they remain no little time with the disciples. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was a cripple from birth who had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet and he sprang up and walked. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying in Laconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Here we see St. Paul performing a miracle by the power of the Lord. First, he comes to this man who had suffered and very much as in the gospel, our Lord comes to those who are there and the man is listening to Paul speaking. So it's not simply an act of power. The man is listening and Paul is speaking. He is speaking of our Lord. He is speaking of the resurrection of Jesus the Lord. Always faith comes through hearing even in the midst of such a great miracle as we're about to experience. 
He listened to Paul speaking. Always faith begins with listening to the word, either in the words we see of a person proclaiming like Paul, or in a few moments in the actions that are signs of God's presence. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright in your feet. And he sprang up and walked. Here is an extraordinary act, a miracle, a sign. Not so often do we find this. In fact, earlier on, just before this, Paul had been preaching in Iconium and uh, no miracles there, but simply the response he gets later on of being stoned and persecuted. But this is spectacular. And occasionally our faith is lifted with something spectacular. But let us see how fruitful that is. It's actually not that fruitful at all. It sort of can be so flash, so much flash and bang and glitter that it can distract from the real profound simplicity of faith. So occasionally the Lord primes the pump with either a miracle or perhaps a deep emotional experience of the Lord. But that's not the heart of what we're engaged in. First, he listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright in your feet. And he sprang up and walked. So let's just, first of all, thank God for any times, perhaps not as spectacular as this, but maybe other times in our life, when we've experienced some beautiful lift to our faith, some great jolt of joy and energy, and thank God for that. And let us also pray that we may simply, when we're not even having those experiences, that we may simply listen to the Lord and listen as intently as this man is listening to Paul. Thanksgiving for gifts given and a prayer that we may be attentive to the true source of faith, which is sometimes found in signs and wonders, but only to help the deeper reality of our ability to be attentive to the word of God. Paul said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and walked. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voice saying in Laconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus. And Paul, because he was the chief speaker, they called Hermes. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the people. Something seems to be going off track here. This is, something's wrong here. The spectacular nature of the sign has so bedazzled the people that in a sense it's getting in the way of the faith. They are ready to start offering oxen to Paul and Barnabas, which is not quite what they had in mind. And sometimes this is true with us as well. It's maybe why the Lord not too often uses dynamite with our faith. More often it's like as in the Old Testament, you know, when uh, we hear not in the thunder and lightning, but in the gentle breeze do we find the Lord. Because we can tend sometimes to get drunk on religion and to look for the, the glitter, the sizzle, not the steak, you might say. And we can't always be lifted up that way. It's, I mean, we'd all, I guess, have a heart attack if our religion was this buffoon like that all the time. That's sometimes what we get in the, the glory of the liturgy and 
and there are miracles of extraordinary power that happen. We see them if we are attentive all the time, but it's not in that that we find our faith. They're simply lifting us, they help us. Because we are so weak of faith that sometimes we need a jolt. So the Lord himself, he would heal people, he would even raise people up from the dead. But that just delayed the funeral. They just meant those people had two funerals instead of one. Even Lazarus, raised from the dead, he died, had a funeral, raised from the dead, he died again. So it helped to get the point across, but it's not quite the central point. So maybe we can just, as we listen to this and think of the Laconians rushing around and getting oxen and garlands to start worshiping the messenger and not the Lord who sent the messenger, maybe we can ask God to help us to give proper thanks for the exciting parts of religion and the great experiences we have, but that we not be centered on them and that we be always able to see through even the beauty of our religious experiences to the point and to the who and the what of what's really happening. That we not mistake the messenger for the Lord who sent him. And we can so easily do this. Just as in the first uh, passages of the letter of the Romans, in a more sort of negative way, these, these were good-natured people wanting to worship Paul. They, they just got it wrong, but they were a little, just a little off. But Paul writes in the first part of his, letter, of his letter to the Romans how people can worship nature instead of the God of nature. That we can sometimes stop short and not see the profound reality. We all have a tendency to do that. That's why St. Francis didn't say, glory be to brother, son, and sister moon. He said, glory be to God for brother, son, and sister moon. We've got to see to the source. So let's ask the Lord to well, thank God for any experiences as exciting as this that he may give us from time to time and ask him to help us to see to the source, to go right there to the Lord and not to be so distracted by the signs of the Lord that we don't come to the one to whom they point. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out among the multitude crying, men, why are you doing this? We also are men of like nature with you and bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. They rush out there, realizing that these good people, who are good people, they're trying to do the right thing, but they're just missing the target. They're worshiping them and they were, we're not God, worship God. This happens, by the way, in the apocalypse as well, where the angel is showing John the marvels and mysteries of God. He's so spectacular that, that John falls to his knees and starts worshiping the angel. And so the angel said, no, no, worship God. Deo Medora, worship God. And when I became a bishop 15 years ago, I thought around what would be a, a motto for for my mission as a bishop. Bishops get to do this, you get to pick a logo, you know? And so I picked as my Episcopal motto, Dea Madara, worship God. Don't go off the track even enthusiastically worshiping something less than that. We honor the angels, but don't worship the angel, worship God. If we get that right, everything else I think will follow. And so they've just gone a little off track. They're of good intention, goodwill. They're trying to do the right thing, but they've missed the point. And so poor Paul and Barnabas, no, stop, stop. Don't you know, put that ox away. This is not, we're not to be worshiped. And he has that line, essentially the same as is found in the Apocalypse. Chapter 22, verse nine. Dea Medora, worship God. Let's pray the Lord now as we listen to this and 
I'll read it again. That we may have the enthusiasm of those good people of Laconia and the eagerness to do right that they surely have, but that we might follow the direction of Paul and Barnabas and not letting our enthusiasm lead us off the track a bit, that we may fly to the heart of things, not to the edge, but fly to the heart of things, and worship God, and everything else will flow from that. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out among the multitude, crying, Men, why are you doing this? We also are men of like nature with you, and bring you good news, that you should turn away from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good and gave you from heaven rains and fruitful seasons and satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. With these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. So the people are excited by a sign and a wonder and move off track. And Paul and Barnabas need to say, wait, no, no. We proclaim to you good news. That's the invitation of faith. It's not to be excited simply by the signs and wonders. It's the good news that they represent, even the miracle of healing calls for a deeper healing, as all the Lord's miracles of healing called for a deeper healing. The gift of sight calling for a deeper sight. The gift of walking calling for a deeper, a more profound walking in the way of the Lord. The gift of even raising from the dead calling for a deeper, more profound resurrection. So all those things which are more spectacular always call us to something deeper, and that's where the act of faith comes in. That's where God draws us beyond what we can see to that which is real, but beyond our capacity to, to grasp. The great definition of faith is faith is an act of the intellect, moved by the will, moved by the grace of God. It is an act of the intellect. Jesus is the Lord, the statement, the fact moved by the will, because it's not obvious, moved by the grace of God, because faith comes through hearing, and sometimes given a bit of a boost through something spectacular, though not often, but above all, it's the grace of God that is the grace of faith that allows us to hear and to respond, if we will be but open to that. And so our Lord talks to them, and the gospel and explains and proclaims the faith. And here, St. Paul looks back at their experience of God over the years. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. This is a fact still to this day. All the things that we like sheep have gone astray, wandering all over the place. That's the defective steering we have, and the Lord allows that to help us to go deeper. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good and gave you from heaven rains and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So here, Paul is going back to what he did in the, what we hear in the, the, the speech in the Areopagus in Athens, and what he does in the first part of the letter to the Romans and elsewhere, having given them by God's grace this jolt of a miracle and finding it kind of was too much oomph in the, in the, the gift of faith there that was kind of distorting them the wrong way, he pulls back a bit and starts reasoning with them, talking about history and talking about nature 
how if we just look at rains and seasons and things, we can kind of see beyond to the presence of the Lord, whom we can see more profoundly through faith. All of these things are ways, are pathways to faith. The experience of signs and wonders, the proclamation of the good news, Jesus is Lord, and the rational description of nature. That helps. That's, you know, reason is good. It's like uh, Pope John Paul in his, uh, says that, you know, in the, the, his letter, Faith and Reason, we fly to the Lord on two wings, faith and reason. And he gave them both, and we, we need them both. And so Paul now starts talking more in terms of reason, to kind of cool down the reactor, you might say, to get them to kind of get, to help them to have received the gift of faith but not in such a spectacular way that it's going to blow them off course. With these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. It, it took a lot to uh, slow them down a bit, to get them to listen. How often it is in our own lives, you know, we, we do not listen. We, even in our religious experiences, too often we can get distracted. We need to just be, have what in the English spiritual tradition they call a naked intent unto God. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. But in our religious experiences, we sometimes can get a little bit carried away. And then we see a different dimension of faith. Up to now, this has been rather jolly and happy, and the most Paul's had to do is cool their jets a little bit by putting a dash of reason into the explosive company situation here of exuberance. But now we see another dimension, another element of faith, which is persecution and pain. And what witnessing means the same word that means martus or martyr. But Jews came here from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the people, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Isn't that amazing? They'd have been about to offer an ox to Paul with garlands and stuff as God. And shortly after that, they're stoning him and they have to drag him out of the city. It doesn't take much. A kind of like, you know, an unhealthy love goes into hate very quickly. There's something wrong there when, in the first place if it turns that quickly to something else. So this kind of unstable adulation turns into stoning in a very short time. Just a few people start, spread the word and boom, away we go. So that kind of tells us that we gotta build more solid foundations than, than just a, the more spectacular dimension. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. And of course, this reminds us too of Palm Sunday, a short time away from Good Friday. We are such fickle people. And so maybe we can ourselves, rather than condemning those people for what they did, let's look into our own hearts and think of the times that we have been all enthusiastic and shortly turned away by some word of usually someone else speaking a word that turns us against God, but also against other people. You know how we're so gung-ho and, oh, a great person, and then somebody slips in a word of poison, and next thing we know, we're dragging them out of the city and stoning them. How fickle we are. And let's ask God's mercy for that. We may be more profoundly committed to the gift of faith in God and to our relationships of love with other people.
But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So Paul and Barnabas are down, but pop back up again. They're on the way and they're bouncing around the countryside to Lystra and Derbe and all, all these places we, we really haven't heard about and that doesn't matter, just fill them in the blanks for our own situation. They're not, they're not lifted up by being worshiped as God. They're not cast down by being stoned. They're just moving on, proclaiming the good news. That's what we're to do too, you know? We're in here, life is a marathon, not a sprint. And if we are deeply rooted in our faith, we will not be puffed up by the moments of exaltation and cast down by the struggles we face. For it is not our struggle, it is not, it's all of God. So that we should think about that. Like you just think of our own situation. You know, we have, well, not long ago, about a little over 10 years ago, Razzle Dazzle, we had the World Youth Day here in Toronto and everyone's singing and dancing and yay, you know. That lasted a few days. Then you go through disasters and you know, boom down. And then and that's why, you know, Pope John Paul is very clear that a World Youth Day is, is the, you know, the, the sizzle is very short. It's if you build the deep foundations ahead of time, I'm mixing metaphors here, but if you, you gotta prepare for it well in terms of what really matters, then you won't be, you know, you get lifted. There's nothing wrong with having a party, you know, this is good and everyone, yeah, you know, cheering and hey, there's the Pope and all that kind of stuff. But that's fundamentally irrelevant. And I remember one principle Pope John Paul always said for the World Youth Days is it's about Christ, not about the Pope. So, you know, we, we get carried away like the Laconians, you know, offering, I don't know there's any oxes being offered up, but you know, all this kind of stuff. But it's not what our faith is about. We have to have that depth. So whether we're being stoned or whether we're being worshiped, we keep our heads. And uh, when others are losing theirs, keep our head. Just while well, talk about keeping our head, my favorite, one of my favorite saints, when uh, this, this ties in very much with what William Roper, the son of Thomas More, when Henry VIII was walking around and hugging the, Thomas More, oh, my best friend, and hey, you know, everyone's saying envious, oh boy, you know, it's just, Thomas More is the best friend of the king. And Roper, his son-in-law, said this to him, oh, it must be something to be so close with the king. And Thomas More said, if my head would win him a castle in France, it would not fail to go. So that's the kind of guy who spent every Friday deep in prayer. And we have to have that as well. I mean, really, this is the long haul. So that's why too, as Christians, oh, there's my little prayer card. Um, as Christians, we are not knocked off course if our faith is deep by disasters, scandals, problems, troubles, external things around us. We expect them to come. And we're not puffed up by temporary successes because that's not what our faith is about. We're in for the long haul. And so they're going around to all these places. Now look what they do, strengthening the souls of the disciples. We need that. Well, you think what they were going through. We all need to strengthen one another, pray for one another especially, encourage one another, strengthen the souls of the disciples. I think what most of the time, a lot of us, you know, we spend our time cutting up the souls of the disciples. That's not what it's about. So strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith because they knew that, you know, God never promised us a rose garden. We're gonna have storms. You know, we're, the faith is not something that is, going, is, it's not shallow, superficial, it's not glittery, it's not glitzy. It's deep, it's profound, it's, it leads us to the new Jerusalem, but it leads us, as they then say, 
strengthening the souls of disciples, exhorting them to continue, be tough and continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And that's Thomas More's last book, A Dialogue of Comfort in Tribulation. And that's how he could then crack jokes on his way to the scaffold. He wasn't distracted by things, but he knew the tribulation. And think of when our own experience is some degree, but think of our brothers and sisters in faith in many parts of the world. And in this city, so this area, so much in touch. Today, we have issued our pastoral plan in seven different languages in the short form in 30. And that's not all the languages of our diocese. Think of how many connections there are here in our community. And many people here have family members who have been shot for proclaiming their faith, who've been murdered. We had here just a, about a year or so ago, a memorial service for those who were murdered at the, in the Syriac Catholic Cathedral in the Middle East. So faith is not something shallow. It is in the midst of tribulation. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And let's ask God to give us strength that we may be deep in faith and rich in faith and true in faith, that we may strengthen one another in faith by our example and sometimes by our words, and that we be ready to keep moving through the tribulations with our eyes on the new Jerusalem. That always throws the tribulators off course too, by the way. They wonder, what is it about these Christians? Which is a good get way to get them inquiring about the faith. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. Well, this is interesting. It's been personal one-on-one -on -one with apostles, Barnabas and Paul, but they're moving on. So they leave a structure behind. They end off with an ordination. With prayer and fasting, they appoint elders to guide the church. There is a structure to our faith. It is a community. It's not a crowd. It's a church. It's a community. It's a communion. It's the city of God in heaven manifested into this world. That too is part of our faith. And it's important because if not, we just, faith becomes what I think God's saying to me. And that makes a real problem, you know. If I think God said to me, thus says the Lord, do this, and someone else in the parish thinks, God said to them, thus says the Lord, do that. How do we know? So that's why the Lord chose 12 apostles and that's why Paul and Barnabas, before they, they headed off down the road to the next town, they appointed elders. So there would be a structure, which is a frame for the diamond of faith. And then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. So they're on the move. They're not at home any one place. So too are we. We're not at home anywhere, really. Our only home is the New Jerusalem. And whether we live in Italia, Pamphylia, Pergia, or Iconium, or Toronto, or Mississauga, or Oshawa, or wherever, our home is the New Jerusalem. We're just passing through. I remember reading somewhere that some father of the church said, our life is like spending a night in a seedy motel on the way <laughs> tomorrow. Well, that must be a rather rough translation, I think. And when they arrived, they gathered the church together so they called the church together. 
It declared all that God had done for them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. They gathered the church together. We live our life between come and go. At the beginning of the gospel, the Lord said, come, come follow me, come and see. At the end, he says, go, make disciples, baptizing them. But first, go make disciples. But we come and we go. But we always need to come before we go. The gathered and the scattered, Peter and Paul, in and out. It's the rhythm of our life of faith. And they remain no little time with the disciples. It's also, they're bouncing around trying to proclaim the faith, but when they're with their community, they're there, the ministry of presence. Just remaining with the disciples is a gift of faith to strengthen them. We need sometimes to be on the road, passing here and there, because we're no, no home here. But we, amongst ourselves though, as we're gathered, we need to remain together, with the, be with the ones we love, be with the Lord we love. The charism of remaining is very important. It's that thing, you know, that's who said that half of the meaning of life is in showing up. And I often think of that when my years as, uh, spent a lot of time helping prepare candidates for the priesthood. You know that a lot, the best thing a priest can do or a bishop can do is just be there. You're not gonna say anything particularly useful, but just be there. It's true, all of us too. You know, when someone's suffering, remember Job's friends? The best thing they did was just remain with Job. The troubles began when they started talking and trying to explain the problem. So maybe just be there, you know? And the same with that family. Have family time, be with the ones we love. You know, we're whipping in and out of the door here and there, but just be there. Quantity in some ways is more important than quality. How do we know quality? We don't judge that. But just spending time with other people is the gift of self because we are made up of time. We give money, we give something in our bank. We give time, we give ourselves. So this is a gift which helps strengthen the faith. That's why we come together for the celebration of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and to pray together. It's not just that it makes for better music or whatever, it's just, it's not organizationally efficient or whatever, although it is. It's because we are the communion of the Lord coming together to hear, to listen, to serve, and then to go. And to open as God opens the door of faith. He opens it, we don't open it, but we just help whatever way we can to be servants of that. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was a cripple from birth who had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and walked. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying in Laconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul because he was the chief speaker, they called Hermes. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the people. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out among the multitude crying, Men, why are you doing this? We also are men of like nature with you and bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good and gave you from heaven rains and fruitful seasons satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. With these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came there from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the people, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, and supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on to, with Barnabas to Derbe, 
that when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. And then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. And when they arrived, they gathered the church together and declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.